today's speaker is uh, Dr. Ben Gross. Ben is the Vice President for Research and Scholarship at the Linda Hall Library in Kansas City. He was previously a research fellow at the Science History Institute and a consulting curator for the Sarnoff Collection at the College of New Jersey. Ben earned a BA in History from Yale University and a PhD in History of Science from uh, Princeton University. He's also one of the great tweeters in the history of science and technology. Uh, it's a great, uh, it's always lots of fun to follow him when he live tweets somebody else's conference presentation when we have those. And um, you can follow him on Twitter at uh, bhgross144. Today's talk comes from uh, Ben's first book, The TVs of Tomorrow, How RCA's Flat Screen Dreams Led to the First LCDs. Uh, which was published in 2018 by the University of Sh Chicago Press as part of the Science History Institute Synthesis Series. Take it away, Ben. All right. Well, thank you very much, Roger. Thanks as well to Vince, who handled all of the tech support for today's talk, and to Daniel, who couldn't be here with us but organized the whole Science Incorporated Lecture Series. And of course, a special thank you to all of you who tuned in from all over the country and the world to uh, listen to this presentation. Because there are probably a few scientists and engineers in the audience, as well as a few former members of RCA's technical staff, I should probably begin this presentation with my standard disclaimer. So here it is. This is a historical discussion. I am not a chemist, a physicist, or an electrical engineer. My degree is in the history of science. So those of you who tuned in to hear me discuss the relative merits of the anisilidine p-aminophenyl acetate derivatives used in the first LCDs as compared to the cyanobiphenyls that eventually replaced them are likely to be woefully disappointed. Nevertheless, I hope that there'll be sufficient technical content here to keep you engaged for the next 40 minutes or so as we consider a fascinating case study of technological innovation. This is a story that's captivated me since I first became affiliated with the Science History Institute in the fall of 2009. That was when I received my first long-term fellowship at what was then known as the Chemical Heritage Foundation. And to give you a sense of how long ago that was, here is a screenshot of the CHF website describing the benefits of a long-term fellowship at the time that I arrived. Pretty nice, right? As a long-term fellow, I was in residence at CHF for the entire academic year, from September 2009 to May 2010. And like all long-term fellows, I had access to an office, my own phone line, and best of all, my own computer. Speaking of which, do you notice anything interesting about the computer in this photo? Here, let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, I'll zoom in again. I'm sorry, I can't enhance it as well. This is as high a resolution an image as I could find on the Internet Archive. If you look at it closely though, you'll notice that there's a bit of a curve to the picture here, which suggests to me at least that this was probably a standard, what was known as a CRT or cathode ray tube monitor. That makes sense. At that point, probably a year or so before I arrived, flat screen monitors weren't as common, but that was beginning to change. In November, 2006, IEEE Spectrum published an article entitled Goodbye CRT, in which the author, Paul O'Donovan, noted that, quote, the next television you buy won't contain a cathode ray tube. And in that article, he went through and looked at a couple of the different technologies that might replace it. As you can see from the parenthetical in the subtitle there, it probably wasn't going to be plasma. The most promising of the technologies that he considered was the liquid crystal display, or LCD. And indeed, a year later, LCD televisions, for the first time, surpassed cathode ray televisions in terms of sales. This article is from February 2008. It describes the fall of 2007, that quarter being the first time that LCD televisions actually surpassed CRTs, which meant that the following year, 2008, was the first year that that could be said as well. Today, the LCD is a basis for a multi-billion dollar business. And to give you a sense of the scale, in 2016, estimated LCD television sales, now just televisions, exceeded $83 billion. That's just televisions, not calculators, wristwatches, digital cameras, cell phones, video games, or anything else. Today, we are living in a world of screens, 
Liquid Crystal displays surround us in our homes and in our offices. In all likelihood, you're using one to watch this lecture right now. And in the age of COVID-19, we're more reliant than ever on LCDs to stay connected with one another. Think about how many of you have relied on Zoom or GoToMeeting or some other teleconferencing app to keep in touch with family, friends, or coworkers. So where did this world of screens begin? Often those sorts of questions don't lend themselves to straightforward answers. But in this case, we can pinpoint it to a very specific place and time. The place was New York City, and the time was May 1968, almost exactly 52 years ago. The Radio Corporation of America invited the press to 30 Rockefeller Center, its headquarters, to unveil a new type of electronic display. James Hillier, who was the vice president in charge of RCA Labs at the time, explained that these new displays relied on a strange and unfamiliar set of materials called liquid crystals and that they offered several advantages over existing electronic displays. You can see one of the prototypes here on the left. The gentleman showing it is named George Heilmeyer. He was in charge of the liquid crystal project at RCA Central Laboratories in Princeton. As you can see, the display that he's showing there is very thin, especially compared to existing cathode ray tube televisions. It also didn't emit any light of its own. That's why he's shining a light on it, because it reflects light rather than emitting any. And because it reflects light, you don't need as much power because you don't have to generate light of its own, right? This combination of uh, characteristics suggested a wide range of potential applications, everything from clocks and calculators to dashboard displays and maybe even televisions, if you can imagine that. At the end of the press conference, James Hillier stated that we have high hopes that they, that is LCDs, will reach their full potential. And when they do, you will learn about it at an RCA press conference similar to this one. As it turned out, he was half right. The LCD would exceed the company's wildest expectations and become the basis for a massive global industry. But RCA would never benefit from the technology it pioneered. Within a decade of that press conference, the company exited the LCD business entirely. And by 1986, RCA had been sold to General Electric. So here we have an interesting contradiction, right? RCA was the first mover in the LCD market, but they were never able to really capitalize on that position. This contradiction is what captured my attention after I made my first visit to the David Sarnoff Library. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, the David Sarnoff Library was RCA's technical archive. It was housed in the David Sarnoff Research Center, the company's main laboratory, uh, which was named after the longtime chairman of the company, David Sarnoff. I went there in December of 2007 as a graduate student. I was studying the history of science at Princeton, and I needed a topic for my uh, second research paper. And I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that there was this amazing archive a few miles down the road. And if I went there and talked with the director of the library, at that point, a gentleman named Alex Magoon, who now works at the IEEE History Center, uh, I might be able to get some ideas. And he suggested that I look into the history of the liquid crystal display. Now, I knew about LCDs, but I had no idea that they were invented in the United States, much less just a few miles down the road from where I was living. And so I started looking into this story. The history of RCA's liquid crystal display project is one of successful invention and failed innovation, right? They had the technology. They invented this remarkable new form of screen, and yet they weren't able to commercialize it effectively. So what happened? To understand that, I would need to dig into the process of intra-firm technology transfer. That is to say, the movement of a technology within a company from, say, the initial discovery or invention in the lab, to the factory, and eventually to the public. All companies deal with this. I wanted to understand what was going on at RCA with this particular technology. And then, of course, was the bigger question, how was I supposed to reconstruct that process? Because a lot of this was happening behind the scenes. The sorts of mistakes or setbacks that might be encountered along the way wouldn't be in published articles or patents, although those were very useful sources. So instead, I relied on archival materials. And you can see a large pile of them in front of me in this picture, which was from right before I came down to Philadelphia. Those are all laboratory notebooks and technical reports and other archival sources that gave 
a, a description in real time as it was happening of what was going on with the liquid crystal project at RCA. So these were things like technical reports, which might have been issued on a monthly or quarterly basis, and uh, lab notebooks like this one, which uh, was written by George Heilmeyer, who we last saw shining a display with a spotlight. Uh, thankfully, he had very neat handwriting. Now, these documents were extremely useful, but I didn't just rely on the written record to tell this story. Uh, indeed, one of the great benefits of my project was that many of the people who worked on liquid crystal research at RCA were still around. In fact, they are still around, and uh, they were living nearby. Remember, I was in Princeton, right by the lab, and a lot of those folks had retired and stayed in town. I was fortunate enough to become a regular participant in a monthly lunch that members of RCA's technical staff hosted. Uh, and while I was there, I would ask them to tell me stories about the good old days, what it was like at the labs. Some of them sat with me one on one and shared their stories. And occasionally, they would give me insights that I wouldn't have found any place else. Their perspectives allowed me to explore RCA's liquid crystal display project from a new perspective. Because all too often, the history of corporate science focuses on managers rather than scientists, the boardroom rather than the laboratory. And as I looked at this project, I realized that any discussion of intra firm technology transfer had to include both because managers rely on members of their technical staff, the folks who have firsthand knowledge of how a technology works to determine whether or not it's worth investing in. These were the people whose assessments shaped the boundaries of technological possibility within which managers made their decisions. Right? One other benefit I should note of interviewing former members of RCA's technical staff was that in addition to stories, they often had additional sources to share. Personal papers, photographs, correspondence, and in a few cases, artifacts. For historians of technology, artifacts are primary sources in and of themselves, shedding light on design challenges and the creative solutions that people developed to resolve them. And today I'm going to discuss one of the artifacts that I encountered during my research, which is currently in the Science History Institute's collections. Here it is. At first glance, this object resembles an empty picture frame. It's about one foot square, and it's mounted on a squat plastic pedestal. As we'll soon discover, however, this isn't an empty frame at all. Instead, I would argue it is a window to today's world of screens. But to understand its significance, we have to go back in time to a few months before RCA unveiled the first LCDs and a fateful field trip to the company's research laboratory in Princeton. The people making that trip were traveling from the Electronic Components Division in Somerville, New Jersey. That was RCA's semiconductor division where they manufactured transistors and integrated circuits. The man on the left there was named Lawrence or Larry Murray, and he was the head of the, the division's device physics group, which among other things had been working on light emitting diodes. Uh, chunks of semiconductor, essentially, that will emit light if you apply a voltage across them. The gentleman on the right was an associate engineer in that group named Richard Klein. Now, Murray and Klein had been to Princeton several times before. RCA scientists had been working on fundamental research into semiconductor materials there for quite some time. So this sort of a trip, that 25 to 30 minute drive between Somerville and Princeton, wasn't a, a big deal. But as Klein informed me in an interview that I conducted, this time Murray went out of his way to mention that we're going down to the labs to see something new. Now, when they arrived, they met up with George Heilmeyer and his technician, Louis Zanoni, and together they walked inside. And as they walked, Heilmeyer explained that they were doing some really interesting work on a set of materials called liquid crystals. Liquid crystals were not new. They'd been known about since the 19th century, but they were really more of a laboratory curiosity than anything else. They were materials that possessed the mechanical properties of a liquid and the optical properties of a crystalline solid. So they could flow and fill a container and take its shape, but if you were to shine light through them, it would be more like shining it through a, a solid crystal than through, say, a glass of water. Right? In 1962, a physical chemist who you can see on the right there, his name was Richard Williams, 
uh, decided to do some experiments on liquid crystals. Williams, I should have just passed away recently. Um, and the work that he did is often overlooked. So I'm taking a little bit more time than I normally would to dig into his story. So Williams was interested in the way that electric fields could affect the absorption of light in crystalline solids. And he decided to extend his experiments to include liquid crystals, and specifically a very well-known liquid crystal called PAA, or para-azoxyanisole. The picture at the bottom of the screen there is the uh, illustration he put in his lab notebook showing this experiment. What he did was took some of this liquid crystal material, put it between two pieces of glass, which had transparent coating lining the inner faces, put that onto a heated microscope stage because you have to heat up liquid crystals to a particular temperature range to see those special properties, and then applied a voltage. And at first, nothing happened at all. He checked again. The temperature was above 110 degrees. He increased the voltage. And after a little bit of time, something interesting happened. He saw this series of rectangular patterns form where the voltage was applied across the sample. That's the top half of that uh, photograph, right? When he turned off the voltage, the rectangular patterns went away. Williams referred to these as domains and noticed that wherever the domains formed, it blocked the passage of light. Now, if you were working at RCA in the 1960s and you figured out a new way to electronically control the passage of light, you immediately thought of displays. RCA was, after all, the company that had just developed color television and was very interested in display technology. So Williams went and talked to some colleagues and said, maybe we can make a display out of this. His colleagues were skeptical. Liquid crystals were still very strange. And again, you had to heat this above the boiling point of water to get the domains to form in the first place. So eventually he set it aside. He wrote a couple of articles about domains and even submitted a patent within RCA for a, uh, a display based on liquid crystals, but he didn't really pursue it much further than that. The research was picked up again in 1964 and 1965, when George Heilmeyer decided to look at liquid crystals as a way to possibly modulate laser light. He reproduced several of Williams's experiments, including this domain experiment, and he decided to take it a little bit further. He increased the voltage by an order of magnitude, and when he did that, the domains disappeared, and instead, turbulence formed throughout the liquid crystal sample, turbulence that scattered light, and Heilmeier referred to this as dynamic scattering. This effect, which was quite impressive, and you'll see it in a minute, was enough to persuade him to reach out to management and persuade them to form a group to work on making displays. Here are some of the members of that group, not all of them, but some. And here is one of the displays they built as early as 1966. This is actually very similar to the way that Klein described his visit. He came in and he looked just as you're looking now at a blank sheet of glass, or at least a seemingly blank sheet of glass. And there wasn't anything very impressive about that until either Heimeyer or his technician, Luzanoni, turned on the voltage and boom, a test pattern appeared. What you're seeing there is dynamic scattering. Wherever there's conductive coating on both sides so you can apply an electric field across the sample, that's where it turns white. And where it's not, it's black. And you can essentially lay down these coatings and etch patterns into them to make whatever sort of image you want. By the way, the uh, newspaper down at the bottom there, that is meant to provide a contrast between the display and a printed page. And it's actually a pretty good comparison. It compares favorably. Murray and Klein looked at this, and they saw a technology with a lot of potential. As Klein put it to me, quote, to me, liquid crystal was a gimme. It had to go because it was the only technology that really matched up well with integrated circuits. It was very low power. It could be scaled up in size. It didn't fight the light in the environment. It used the light in the environment. These are the same sorts of properties that Heilmeier and Hillier would call attention to at RCA's 1968 press conference, and which would be repeated by the press underneath headlines like these, right? Talking about potential applications like super thin instant blinds, or sorry, super thin TV and instant blinds. But Heilmeier knew that the displays that he had created were not ready for consumers just yet. To give you an example of this, 
even after several months when they decided to go public and they brought out the first liquid crystal display clock, which you can see down in the corner, that clock stopped working within minutes of that photograph being taken. And I have that from the gentleman in, in the uh, picture's perspective. He told me about this. Within minutes of holding up his watch, that clock died. These things were not ready for prime time. They needed to be manufactured in a more robust fashion. And that meant they needed people with manufacturing expertise. And who better to turn to than the folks at RCA's semiconductor division, who had experience with manufacturing and also who were working with semiconductors and integrated circuits that might be useful with some of the potential products they could make with liquid crystals. And that was how a liquid crystal display operation began in Somerville, New Jersey. It involved engineers and chemists and physicists. I tried originally to fit a lot of their names on here. I didn't have room because there were a bunch. Folks from Princeton, like Lou Zanoni, who you can see sitting down in that picture there, and I'll talk more about that picture in a moment, uh, brought over some samples of liquid crystals and explained to Klein and some of his colleagues how to build these displays. And then they started getting to work. Over time, this group grew so large that as one of their participants, Sandor Kaplan, who was an engineer in the group, noted there was no space available for, you know, such a gigundic undertaking at Somerville. And I had to fight the editors of my book to keep the word gigundic in there. They moved to a small warehouse in Raritan, New Jersey, which was right nearby, and they started trying to set up a pilot plant. By the way, that picture, I should note, features both Richard Klein in the back, who is uh, holding up the drill and uh, fake hijacking what was known as the Havana Special. This is a cockpit that the Liquid Crystal Group put together with a few LCD readouts to show how you could use displays in cockpit instrumentation. All right? And I love this picture because you can see uh, there's Richard Klein and there's Sandy Kaplan, uh, who I just quoted there. There's Art Elsie in the front and Lou Zanoni and Ron Freeover from Princeton. So you can see this was literally the moment that they transferred uh, the technology, or it embodies that moment where they transferred the technology from the lab in towards the operating divisions. So what were they doing in Raritan? Well, there were a lot of manufacturing challenges if you wanted to start making displays. For example, you had to scale up liquid crystal production. Some of the chemists at RCA's Princeton labs, most notably Joel Goldmacher and Joe Castellano, had figured out that if you used derivatives of their liquid crystal of choice, N-acilidine P-aminophenyl acetate, or APAPA for short, and you mix a couple of different versions of this, you make a few derivatives of it and you mix them together, you can tailor the temperatures so that it will actually be a room temperature liquid crystal and you don't have to heat it above 100 degrees Celsius as Williams had originally had to do. But they still had to mass produce that, or at least produce it in scales larger than you would use on a lab bench. In addition to this, if you're manufacturing these things for the general public, you couldn't rely, as uh, Heilmeier and Zanoni had in the past, on synthetic quartz as your substrate. Now, that synthetic quartz was great at taking the, uh, the various coatings that you would use to create the liquid crystals, but it was really expensive. Kaplan found an alternative uh, being manufactured by Pittsburgh plate glass for use in airplane cockpits. And finally, there was the question of filling and sealing the displays. I won't read through this entire quotation, but it's worth noting that final sentence at the end uh, that Klein uh, provided here as an explanation that after they would inject these liquid crystals into, they wouldn't seal them. They would just clamp them together. And that wasn't going to work if you were going to put that out into a product, right? They had to come up with a way to seal it. They tried using a variety of epoxies, but some of those epoxies reacted with the liquid crystals and poisoned the display. Ultimately, they decided to proceed using frit, which was a form of binding material using glass beads and some various binding chemicals that had previously been used in television picture tubes to seal the glass to the metal. As they solved all these problems, they eventually were able to develop a flow diagram which you can see on the left here, to show how to manufacture liquid crystal cells, how to actually set up an assembly line and make that process happen. But developing the process was only half of the problem. The other half was, what are you actually going to make? What kind of products can you make with liquid crystal displays? RCA didn't give a lot of direction on that front. They were willing to provide staff and equipment and materials, but they didn't provide a lot of money and they didn't provide a lot of 
uh, strategic guidance. For that, the folks at Raritan had to seek out external funding on their own. And they ultimately turned to a marketing executive named Jack Riddell, who found three contracts for three very different kinds of products. The first product was sponsored by the Jervis Corporation, a glass company, which was interested in using liquid crystals in a dynamic scattering rear view mirror for automobiles, right? You would turn on the liquid crystals, you would switch on the dynamic scattering, and it would diffuse nighttime glare. A great concept, seems relatively straightforward, but remember liquid crystals have to be kept in a certain temperature range, even if it's say, negative five degrees outside. So you can see from Kaplan's patent here, that this was a rather sophisticated piece of equipment. You had to have a thermostat and a, a heater in there. The second company to provide a contract was named Veter Root, and they were a gauge and tabulator company that was interested in using liquid crystals in a gas pump readout to say how much gas you pumped and how much money you might have to pay, if you can envision something so far-fetched. They were willing to provide $100,000 for that product, and it might have looked something like this image here from RCA's 1971 annual report on the right-hand side of the screen. The third company was named Ashley Butler, and they were interested in advertisements. Now, what kind of an advertisement could you make with a liquid crystal display? Well, something like this. This was a prototype point of purchase advertising display. Essentially, it was a simple animation that was intended to persuade people to buy in this case, Excedrin, right? And you can see it's a series of simple patterns using dynamic scattering to tell a story. Here you have a gentleman with a headache, then he takes an Excedrin, and then he gets Excedrin relief. This was it before it was assembled. And as some of you might have gathered, the artifact that I showed you at the beginning of this story, it's one of those displays. Specifically, it's an advertisement for Calvert Whiskey. Now I should note that the display here was actually constructed a few years later than the work we're discussing, but the operating principle is the same. And hopefully I'll be able to show it to you because it still works. As you look at this, I want you to think about all the engineering challenges that had to be solved before this screen could go into operation, right? scaling up the production of liquid crystal mixtures, figuring out ways to lay down the patterns that you see on the screen. So it looks like letters or a picture of a whiskey bottle. Coming up with ways to seal the display, laying down electrical contacts so that it will switch on and off in the proper sequence, right? Rigging up a timing mechanism. <clears throat> I wouldn't have known about that last piece if it weren't for Richard Klein, who told me that his experience as an undergraduate actually fed into the design of this display. When he was at Cornell as an undergrad, he was involved in a contest to essentially decorate his dorm and wanted to sequentially turn on and off lights in the dorm at different times. For that application, he used a toilet paper roll with aluminum foil to rig up something kind of like a music box, right? With little cams that would come into contact as it rotated around with a particular piece of circuitry or a wire in that case. Here, it's a similar concept, not a toilet paper roll, but a similar idea. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't talked to the person who designed it, All right? So these products were delivered to each of their respective clients. Clients were happy. RCA, however, still didn't put a lot more money into the project. This led to some concern that they had no idea what they were doing and that they hadn't thought about all the applications. That wasn't quite true. In 1970, RCA published a marketing study that had been conducted with contributions from Princeton. George Heilmeyer was involved, for example, a few of the manufacturing team, a few members of the manufacturing team from Raritan, and some marketing executives from New York. They looked at a lot of different applications. You can see some of them here, right? Uh, dashboard displays, street signs, an electronic curtain, and maybe even a TV, although only black and white at this point. Color was just too far ahead to think about. Their conclusion was as follows. LCDs have, quote, relatively small market potential, except alphanumeric displays, point of purchase, advertising signs, and flat glass glazing. And if that sounds familiar, it's because those were the products that they were already working on for those contractors. Now, that didn't stop folks like 
Klein and Kaplan and their colleagues from trying to promote other ideas. For example, can you imagine using liquid crystals in a wristwatch? These are not actual wristwatches. They have plugs. You can kind of see the wires sticking out from the back. But the idea was interesting. The problem was that there was opposition to it from within Raritan and Somerville from their management team who were aware of this marketing result and were very reluctant to invest any additional money in the concept. Uh, one, of, one or two of the managers there were also particularly abrasive in terms of their personality, uh, which made things even more difficult. I still think that they probably could have overcome this, but there were other problems to consider, most notably opposition from an unusual source, RCA's Princeton Labs, right? The folks who had developed the technology in the first place were starting to get frustrated that nothing was being done. And by the way, maybe the technology just wasn't going to go anywhere. They were beginning to doubt its long-term potential. And the best evidence I have of this is a licensing report that I found in the Sarnoff Library archives. This was intended for other companies to persuade them that they might want to purchase RCA's patents and make their own LCDs. But as you'll see, an uh, unnamed joker with a pair of scissors and some rubber cement decided to modify that document slightly. The title page is featured up in the top left corner of this slide. RCA liquid crystals, it read, and then someone had pasted in a message, be suspicious. A page on liquid crystal preparation, which you can see on the right, was amended with a picture of a goofy scientist who was holding a cup of what looks like tea, under, uh, and underneath that, there is a slogan, simple and idiot proof. But the most damning sentiment was embodied in the summary on the bottom left, which listed the advantages of liquid crystal displays, and then included a message, Nixie tubes are better. Now, for those of you who don't know about Nixie tubes, I've put a picture of one here in the center of the screen. Before liquid crystal displays, Nixie tubes were among the most common and popular digital indicators. They were essentially neon tubes with the number zero through nine spelled out in their filaments. They were ex almost exactly the antithesis of the LCD, right? The LCD was flat. Nixie tubes were tubes, they were bulky. Uh, liquid crystal displays were rugged. Nixie tubes were fragile. Nixie tubes emitted light, liquid crystal displays reflected light. And therefore, Nixie tubes required more power than liquid crystal displays. They were everything that liquid crystal displays weren't. And yet, someone was still saying they were better. Now, was this a real criticism, or were they just making fun of someone else who had that opinion? I don't know. What I do know is that this report came out in September 1971, which was a bad time for liquid crystals to suddenly have their technological merits uh, being doubted. And the reason for that was this gentleman, Robert Sarnoff. I've mentioned David Sarnoff a few times. He was RCA's chairman, and he had risen up through the ranks of the company, uh, starting as a wireless operator. Robert Sarnoff followed in his father's footsteps, but instead of doing the kind of technical side of the business or getting involved with the technical side of the business, he rose up through the management and marketing side, becoming president of NBC before uh, taking over for his father. He wanted to make his own mark in the company. He literally changed the company trademark, as you can see in this picture, to the now familiar trigram in that sign. He also transformed RCA itself from just an electronics company to a conglomerate, buying unrelated businesses like Hertz Rent-A-Car and Banquet Frozen Foods and Coronet Carpets. The joke was under Robert Sarnoff, RCA no longer stood for Radio Corporation of America. It stood for rugs, chickens, and autos. And when people asked him why was he doing this, he said, well, I would like to make RCA a major player in computers. If you think about that, this was a very uh, bold goal because there was already a major player in computing, IBM. And RCA was trying to cut into its market share while maintaining its dominant position in television and uh, these new businesses that it had just taken on. They had a plan. In 1965, they had released their Spectra 70 mainframes, which were compatible with IBM System 360's software, but they sold for less money. So the idea was IBM uh, would come out with these new expensive mainframes and RCA would undercut them on cost. The problem was that IBM came up with a whole new system, as they did in 1970, 
with their system 370, RCA had to adapt, and that ran into money. Eventually, RCA noticed that they just couldn't keep pace. And reluctantly, Robert Sarnoff decided in September 1971, the same month I should note as that licensing report's publication date, that they should get out of the business. And they sold off their computer operation to Sperry Univac for $127 million. The Wall Street Journal reported it was the biggest business disaster since the Edsel. And now you can see why it was a bad time for the LCD to suddenly be questioned, right? Because this rippled throughout the company. There was a literal decimation of the budget, 10% cut across the board at RCA Labs. Six to 7% of the staff was cut, and any projects that were on the borderline were simultaneously on the chopping block. Now, some people involved with the Liquid Crystal project had left before then. Uh, Heilmeyer, for example, had pursued a White House fellowship. Other people left to take on new projects. RCA was just starting work on a new uh, video recording project that would eventually turn out to be the RCA video disc, Glad to talk about that another time. And a few people left to start their own businesses or pursue their own business opportunities with liquid crystals. More on that in a moment. Things were worse at Raritan, where they had over 30 people involved with the project, and after the cuts, they were down to about eight. That didn't stop liquid crystal manufacturing at RCA completely. They kept going. They even moved ultimately to a slightly bigger facility uh, because they were making numeric counters for calculators and wristwatches. But it was all for other companies. They were relying on external contracts. And it was never seen as a major source of profit for the company. So in spring 1976, after Robert Sarnoff was finally uh, removed as head of the company, the new CEO decided it was time to trim the fat, and he sold off the liquid crystal operation to Timex in 1976. So normally that's where this story ends, right? RCA got into the business and they tried their best to make liquid crystals work and then it failed, the end. But I would argue it isn't quite as clear cut as that. RCA scientists and engineers had been involved in shaping the development of this technology from the very beginning. And just because RCA itself was no longer involved, that didn't mean they weren't going to continue to influence the industry in interesting ways. I'll give a few examples. The gentleman on the left here is named Wolfgang Helfrich. He was a member of Heilmeier's research group and approached him with an interesting idea that he had come up with while studying how electric and magnetic fields affected liquid crystals on a molecular level. Specifically, he suggested making a kind of a helical structure out of liquid crystal molecules that could guide the passage of polarized light as it moved through a liquid crystal cell. Helfrick suggested this could form the basis for a new type of display. Heilmeier, however, by that point, uh, Helfrick said that he, he approached him in 1969, and by that point, Heilmeier noted they were investing a lot of money in dynamic scattering, or at least a lot of time. Uh, so that wasn't really an, an idea that they wanted to replace. And oh yeah, use polarized light, which doesn't look as good. Uh, it's dimmer. So Helfrick ends up leaving shortly before the, uh, the company gets out of the computing business moves to Switzerland and gets a job at Hoffman La Roche, where he teams up with the gentleman on the right, Martin Schott, to make this, the twisted pneumatic display, which should look familiar to anyone who owned a digital wristwatch or calculator after the mid 1970s or so, right? By the way, twisted pneumatic displays like this are also in your television and laptop screens. They serve essentially as light shutters for every single individual pixel. Some of the uh, folks who were working uh, at RCA and then went on, went on to start new technologies, they also went on to start new businesses or pursue new business opportunities. For example, Louis Zanoni, RCA's, uh, sorry, Heimeyer's technician, <coughs> excuse me, joined a new company founded by another colleague of his, a laser researcher named Zoltan Kish. That company was called Optel, and they succeeded in making actual liquid crystal display wristwatches, the first liquid crystal display wristwatches in the world, developed in Princeton by an RCA spinoff. You can see these are actually using twisted pneumatic displays. Ashley Butler, the company that funded that liquid crystal advertising display that I showed you earlier, they became so interested in liquid crystals, they actually hired Klein, Kaplan, and a few of their colleagues 
to go into the business themselves for a little bit. And you can see a clock that they developed. This is from an ad in the New York Times from 1974. But perhaps the most lasting legacy of RCA's manufacturing efforts revolved around another field trip. Now remember, we started this with a this story with a field trip to Princeton, and we're going to end it with a field trip to Somerville. And the gentleman who made the field trip was this guy on the right. His name was Tadashi Sasaki. He worked at the Hayakawa Electric Company, a consumer electronics firm that was in the midst of trying to develop a portable electronic calculator and had run into some real hurdles because any of the displays they would use to show the numbers, well, they took too much power. You couldn't use Nixie tubes, for example, because you'd have to plug it in, and that really undermines the whole portability concept. After RCA's press conference in 1968, one of Sasaki's colleagues, a chemical engineer named Tomi Wada, approached him and said, maybe these liquid crystals that folks at RCA have been working with could solve our problem. Sasaki traveled all the way across the Pacific went to Somerville and talked to RCA's management team about the possibility of a collaboration. Now, RCA scientists and engineers had thought about this. Hillier had mentioned calculators at the 68 press conference. They had even included a picture of a, quote, mini computer with liquid crystal displays, a mock-up that they had developed as a potential application in that 1971 licensing report we talked about earlier. But they decided not to pursue this opportunity. It was just outside of what they thought was technologically or commercially feasible. They gave Sasaki a license and told him that he was welcome to invest in the technology on his own. Sasaki went home after paying for the license and the Hayakawa Electric Company began to research liquid crystals more extensively and invested a lot of money into it. And they ultimately succeeded in releasing the first liquid crystal display calculator with a, with a uh, I'm sorry, the first portable calculator with a liquid crystal display readout. And if you haven't heard of the Hayakawa Electric Company, that's totally fine. Because by the time that calculator was released in April 1973, the firm had changed its name to Sharp. And indeed, it was Sharp that ultimately was responsible for this. A full color 14 inch LCD television. They presented it to the public in 1988, two decades after RCA's press conference in New York and two years after that company's purchase by General Electric. In the end, it wasn't that much larger than the animated advertisement that Richard Klein and his colleagues had developed at RCA's liquid crystal operation. And much like that display, this television was also a window towards today's screen-filled future. But at the same time, this screen also serves as a portal to the past a beautiful reminder of the RCA scientists who imagined that liquid crystals could be incorporated into displays, and the engineers and technicians in Raritan who took the first steps towards transforming those dreams into practical realities. And if you'd like to learn more about that story, then might I recommend a book? It's called The TVs of Tomorrow, and as Roger said, it was published as part of the Synthesis series by the Science History Institute and the University of Chicago Press, and it goes into this story in much more detail than I could here. Uh, and with that, I think I'll wrap up. Thank you all for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Ben. We wish we we wish we could applaud you, but uh, but you just have to uh, you have to hear that and hear that in your head. Um, <laughs> so um, we've got about uh, 13 minutes um, for questions. Um, please feel free to uh, to send them to me uh, privately, um, and I will I'll um, curate those. Um, I wanted to, um, oh, and I wanted to say that um, Ben is particularly interested in, in hearing from uh, anybody um, who uh, who may have been mentioned in this uh, in this talk um, or who had worked at uh, uh, at RCA. Um, so uh, if you if you're having trouble with the chat, just um, just uh, wave on your webcam and I'll um, and uh, uh, I'll uh, I'll call on you. Um, so actually, Ben, maybe I'll I'll um, start off with a real just a real quick question. Um, you're you mostly tell tell a very um kind of uh story that's internal to to the corporation um here mm -hmm. and i wonder if you could touch a little bit on some of the um the external developments that are that are also um shaping uh rca's choices here i was i was especially kind of noticing all the um connections to um aerospace and remote no you know know that that's is sort of coinciding with your time period here as a decline in um, NASA's um, spending for research and development, and the, the U.S. Air Force is buying more and more 
existing planes to fight the Vietnam War rather than um, spending on, on R and D during during kind of that five year period um, as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so one of the things I didn't get into a little bit was that there were still um, kind of prototype development projects underway at RCA's Princeton Lab, and some of them were actually funded by NASA uh, because they realized that cathode ray tubes are very heavy, and if you want to include uh, instrumentation, for example, it might be nice to have something light and thin that you could send up with astronauts. Uh, but the problem was, as you noted, NASA funding, well, it was uh, rather plentiful in the mid to late 60s. It did start to decline over time. So ultimately, that project, uh, they had a, a kind of beginning there, but they weren't able to get to the point where they could start incorporating it into any missions or, you know, capsule design or that sort of thing. Uh, just because uh, by the time they might have gotten to the point where it was viable and, um, you know, actually manufacturable as opposed to just like a lab prototype, RCA had kind of uh, scaled back its investment because that was, uh, you know, after the computer crisis. The other thing that's worth noting, of course, is that there are a couple of, of major issues happening in American science policy. Uh, one is that there was less investment or concern about investment uh, in fundamental research with no guaranteed long-term payoff. By the late 1960s, you have studies that are going on essentially trying to figure out, uh, is it worth it for the Department of Defense to you know, provide all these contracts when you don't know if there's gonna be any practical application resulting from it? So RCA's labs started pivoting a little bit to try to figure out if they could focus on less fundamental work and more practical work, and whether or not that also affected the lab's overall budget, I think, or contributed in some way to the shaping of the liquid crystal project, I think also needs to be considered. Great. So um, uh, Thomas Finley um, has a question um, for you. He asks, um, who made the LCD uh, displays for the early Texas Instruments and uh, Hewlett Packard handheld calculators of about 1972? So I will admit, I'm not sure exactly who made those displays, because as soon as RCA gets the news out there, and once it becomes clear that liquid crystal displays um, could find their way into a lot of different applications, you have big companies like Texas Instruments who are investing, so it's possible they made them themselves, or it's possible that they contracted to a company like RCA or any of the other spin-offs that kind of uh, flew off from it, because it might just be cheaper and easier that way. For example, Optel, when they were making wristwatches, they made the displays, but they often would contract with other companies, in that case, to make things like the chips that would go into their wristwatches. So I wish I could give you a definite answer on that. It's a great question. Uh, my suspicion is that probably TI had a lot of uh, manufacturing capacity of its own, but they were also dividing their digital indicator, um, their digital indicator budget between those and LEDs until the mid 70s. So I suspect that it probably was an, an external contractor, but I don't know who. Great. Um, so uh, Ingrid um, Ockert, who's a postdoc um, and research fellow at the Science History Institute, asks um, that, uh, she says, you mentioned that Sarnoff's son rose through the ranks through the advertising side. Uh, and she wants to know, was RCA still perceived as, um, as an industry leader in the public's eye in the 1970s? In the late 1960s, when Robert Sarnoff took over, yes. Uh, through the mid to late 1960s, RCA was known publicly as, quote, the most trusted leader or the most trusted name in electronics. Uh, and remember, they were the ones who owned NBC, for example. So they had a very prominent public footprint. That started to decline really after the, the computer debacle, after the investment in computers, and also due to rising competition, uh, and this is another external factor I didn't really get into here, from Japan, right? As the American consumer electronics industry was facing new competition. They also had some domestic competition, I should point out. Firms like Zenith, for example, were cutting into their market share more and more uh, by the late 1960s and early 1970s. So this was another reason that Robert Sarnoff thought it might be a good idea to go into computing, and that ultimately uh, damaged the company's reputation. But RCA had a, a long history. I mean, since the end of World War I, they had been involved in developing America's electronics um, infrastructure. Uh, it would take a lot to, to ultimately diminish that reputation uh, completely. Gotcha. Great. Thanks. Um, so Richard, uh, Rich Klein asks, 
Um, what other technologies did RCA drop the ball on? Um, <laughs> integrated the the um, the metal oxide uh, integrated circuits, video recording, laser diodes, so on. So first off, I want to give a special thank you to Rich Klein uh, for asking that question and also for pro providing me with so much information about the manufacturing side of this story because there aren't a lot of records from Somerville that have survived. And if it weren't for oral histories with him and other people, I wouldn't have been able to uh, write my book or tell this story. Now, to answer his question, um, there are a lot. The short answer is that RCA was involved in a lot of different technological breakthroughs, and you've named a few of the, the ones I would point to most immediately. Video recording is a great example. RCA was among the first to develop um, video tape recording technology. Uh, they did it around the same time as another company called Ampex and ultimately had to cross license with them, so they didn't get to really capitalize on it in a serious way. Uh, CMOS integrated circuits, that is to say complementary metal oxide semiconductor integrated circuitry, which among other things uh, are found in the microprocessors that run our computers today, uh, those were developed initially at RCA, but they never really invested in them in a serious fashion because they never tried to uh, take advantage of their main benefit, which was you could scale up the production of them, the, 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 um, the number of them on a given microchip without worrying about um, a significant increase in power use. Um, and CMOS integrated circuits would ultimately find their way into those early uh, wristwatches, like Optel wristwatches, but it wasn't RCA manufacturing them, it was another smaller semiconductor firm. Um, I mean, we could go on at length about this, but it's interesting to think about how large companies, established companies, uh, particularly by the 1960s and 70s, you start seeing them having a tougher time taking on uh, new inventions and commercializing them, and often leaving it to firms like Optel, to take the example of the wristwatch, right? RCA, the established manufacturer, didn't make the liquid crystal wristwatch. The spin-off firm did. And that's partly because they didn't have any of the pre-existing commitments associated with being a large established firm. Gotcha. Um, so uh, Art Elsie would like to know more about um, Timex and the, the connections to Timex. So first off, uh, hi, Art. Thank you for tuning in. and. Uh, Hope you didn't mind that I, I threw in a little cameo of you in that uh, in that photo. Um, to be totally honest, the Timex side of the story is one that I only know a little bit about. Uh, I've talked with a few folks at RCA when they sold the, the Timex operation to, um, I'm sorry, when they sold the liquid crystal operation to Timex, some of the RCA staff members stayed on to help with the transition. And they essentially were providing Timex with a foothold into the LCD market because up to that point, they had been very reluctant to invest in either LCDs or LEDs. They were a mechanical watch company. You know, Timex, they take a licking and keep on ticking. Uh, so when you suddenly get the possibility that uh, having mechanical clockworks were going to be replaced with chips or, you know, and the face of the clock was going to be replaced with a display, they wanted as much help as they could get. So. The, uh, the purchase of the, uh, of the RCA liquid crystal operation was really meant to just give them the beginnings of a kind of understanding of how to manufacture liquid crystals so they could scale up later in larger factories, uh, first in the United States and then around the world. Great. Um, so I think we've got maybe, we've got one more time for one more, one more good question here by uh, Robert Davidson um, who asks, um, have you considered comparing this story with similar ones at Xerox, right? The story of the mouse-based computing and Kodak, where which developed digital photography. Um, are there other are there stories of companies that that did successfully commercialize their own inventions? So there are examples of uh, companies that did successfully commercialize their own inventions. A great example of that would be something like the transistor, right? AT and T developed it at Bell Labs and ultimately was able to manufacture it. Um, you could look at a, a couple of other examples along similar lines. Um, the comparison that you draw is one that several other people have, have pointed out, right? Um, we think about the golden age of American innovation uh, during, say, the 1950s and 60s, uh, when you have companies like, well, here's one, for example, RCA successfully invented color television, and they made a, a, they made a lot of money off of it. Uh, the problem is that over time, and there have been a lot of studies of this, right, established companies like this tend to find it difficult to justify 
sustained investment in technology whose market isn't necessarily as clear cut. This is often discussed in the context of so-called disruptive innovation. One of the things that I point out in my book, however, is that what technologies are considered disruptive varies from context to context, right? So what might be a disruptive technology at RCA might be seen as a reasonable technology at a spinoff. And then there could be disruptive technologies that the spinoff finds after trying to turn their technology. So for example, twisted pneumatic displays were initially seen as disruptive at Optel, where they thought that they were going to focus on dynamic scattering, which was itself seen as disruptive at RCA. So the short answer to your question, and it's a good one, is uh, yes, there are examples of companies that succeed in commercializing their, their new technologies, but there are also many examples, much like you've described, of established companies having difficulty um, making a pivot, particularly, uh, for example, with Kodak, uh, you know, they were big into not just making cameras, they were big into making film. So eliminating film would be a rather significant issue for them. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Um, you know, for anybody's questions that are left in the queue, please feel free um, to uh, to email them to the lunchtime lectures uh, at sciencehistory.org, and we will uh, pass them along to Ben. Um, you can also uh, drop them in the chat, but these that but the chat does disappear after uh, after we uh, after we log off. Um, so let's all thanks thank Ben again, and. Uh, next week's talk, same time, uh, at one o'clock on uh, Eastern time on Wednesday, will be by uh, Matthew Schindel, a curator at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. And he'll be speaking about his new biography of the chemist, um, Harold Ure. So thank you everybody for joining. Appreciate it. You can tune in for that. That's gonna be good. Uh, Matt and I were fellows at the same time at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Oh, fantastic. Thanks everybody for tuning in. It was a real pleasure sharing this with you. Yes, indeed. Thanks so much.